You're listening to Recovery Survey, the podcast that shatters stigmas around different types of addictions and takes a deep dive into spiritual principles. I spent time in a foster home and then another foster home and then a group home and then a detention center. And the world really kind of rolled along in what would be, I would say, a pretty natural or unnatural, if you want to say, progression of how a young person's alcoholism and and addiction can take over. My guest today is named Kevin Barheit. He is the author of the book Dear Stephen Michael's Mother, a memoir, which is set for release on November 10th, 2020. Kevin has also developed a YouTube channel where he talks about issues like abandonment, adoption, child sex abuse, and addiction. Kevin also serves on the board of the Rainbow Access Initiative, which helps the LGBTQ plus community with physical and mental health care. Kevin is also a senior learning and inclusive technology analyst at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for having me today on the show. I appreciate your time. Absolutely, man. Glad to have you on the show. Yeah, it, it's exciting. I know we talked last week and it was, I felt like that was me sitting in my backyard, you sitting wherever you were sitting. And I almost wish we could have just recorded that whole thing because I think that's what it's all about. And in, in recovery for me is, uh, you know, the meeting out, uh, meeting after the meeting, the meeting outside of the meeting, those kind of relationships. And I hope that, you know, what we do here today is kind of a, an extension of that. I know for me, uh, when I, when I was out there, um, it was, it was pretty horrendous and I don't want to do a war story here. It's just not worth it to me or to anyone else, uh, just for the highlights and for the sake of anyone listening. The, uh, one of the hardest things for me was when I first came into recovery was the word surrender. Just the idea of surrendering to anything, uh, was, was a pretty, a pretty big negative to me. Uh, it was, it was awfully hard. It took me probably about six, seven years to really, struggle with uh, that understanding of surrendering and what it means in the principles of the program. Uh, There's, there's a lot of reasons for that, but mostly it's just self-will run riot and ego and things like that. But I was surrendered when I was, when I was born, my, my biological mother surrendered me. Um, I wasn't raised by my biological family. Uh, I was adopted when I was two months old. And so the idea of not being wanted, not being accepted, not being a part of, uh, really was something that was, uh, ingrained in me somewhat, somewhat wired, hardwired. And that would have probably been pretty reasonable, I think in some ways, because I did have two loving parents and a family that was not alcoholic or abusive in any way. But when I was nine, I was molested uh, and it wasn't by my family members. It was by a 4-H leader. And so the idea of surrendering really, felt foreign to me. It felt dangerous to me because I had been surrendered. I had been given up. I had trusted other people, other adults, other leaders in my life. And I felt the idea of surrendering was, was not something that I was going to, I was going to take lightly. But I think as a part of what happened after those, those initial parts of my life, those initial experiences, I started drinking when I was 11 and I quickly, quickly, I would say immediately surrendered to that. That was something that allowed me to feel like I didn't have to surrender. I could drink and it made me more, more able to be the person I wanted to be. I could be funny. I could be gregarious. I could get out of myself. I could assert my will. I could be the person I wanted to be. I didn't have to be that kid. I was an only child. I didn't have to be that kid who you had to hang a pork chop around the neck to get other people to play with them. And I think that that was really important to me when I, when I went through all the years of addiction and drinking and the life that came with that. Um, it was important to me to recognize when I came into recovery um, that there, the problem wasn't around me and the problem wasn't even the alcohol. The problem was me. Throughout all the years after I started drinking, especially 11, 12, 13, 14, I immediately went down the rabbit hole. I did not drink a little bit. 
first time I ever drank at 11, I drank a six pack. I woke up the next morning and said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I did. I focused on finding the drink, finding it in my parents' liquor cabinet, finding it with my friend Tony, finding it with Eddie, finding it with my friends and, and started stealing so I could have money so I could buy more alcohol. Quickly, that turned into also the drugs. Uh, I was born in the 60s and I was raised in the 70s. And that's the time when I really went into a very dark place. Much of what happened in those early years um, set, the, set the real stage for how people would see me and I think how, how I would see the world. And it was quite literally waking up in the morning, even at 12, 13, 14 years old, and drinking just to start my day. Drinking on the way to school. I OD'd for the first time when I was 12. I was put in the back of a police car when I was 13. I was taken out of my home, my adoptive home, when I was 14 years old and put into foster care system again. And I spent time in a foster home and then another foster home and then a group home and then a detention center. And the world really, really kind of rolled along in what would be, I would say, a pretty natural or unnatural, if you want to say, progression of how a young person's alcoholism and, and addiction can take over. When I was 15... This is just another part of the story that, again, is, is a difficult one, but I was, I was gang raped. Uh, and that happened on the streets of Schenectady, where I, where I live, where I was raised, and where I live now. And I didn't know any of these things were problems. I didn't know the adoption, the, the abandonment issues were a problem. I didn't know being molested at nine. I didn't even know I was molested. It was just something that happened in my life. The drinking and the, and the way that I, you know did the drink and did the drugs and focused on that, that didn't, that wasn't a problem. That was the solution. And getting gang raped and taken out of my home and put in foster homes and all these things, these were just circumstantial. They didn't have a reflection on something I thought needed to change. When I was around 16, I, I was put back into my adoptive home, but that lasted literally weeks, if not a month or two. And then I left. I was 16. I was a high school dropout. I went on the streets. And the next several years were, were pretty painful. I, I did have a child when I was 16. My oldest daughter was born when I was 16. Youngest when I was 17. I was 18 when I joined the Navy. 19 when I got thrown out. 20 when my wife left me. And by the time I was 20 years old, I was without a wife. My kids had been taken away from me. Couldn't hold a job. And I turned to prostitution on the streets. As a male prostitute. And I'm giving you these pieces because you can fill in all the blanks. There was a lot of drugs. There was a lot of alcohol. There was a lot of uh, arrests. There was a lot of jail time. And um, there were about seven felonies that I was arrested for at one point, including a DWI at another place. But all those things didn't matter because I wasn't going to stop because I didn't have a problem. The problem was that I just needed to be able to navigate the life circumstances and continue to drink and drug. It didn't matter that I was drinking and drugging. It mattered that I got arrested for drinking and drugging. It didn't matter that I behaved in a way that put me in jail. It mattered that I avoid being put in jail, not by changing my behavior, but by not getting caught, not by stopping the drinking and drugging, but by trying to really navigate how can I drink as much as I need to, use as much drugs as I need to, without having to pay the consequences, and it just didn't work. I think that by the time I got in the program, I was at not the worst bottom of my life, but one of the many bottoms in the last couple of years of my life. And I stopped on New Year's Eve. I decided to make a New Year's resolution on January 1, 1986, right at midnight, I told my girlfriend, I'm going to stop drinking and drugging. Of course, she ran in the other room into the, to my bedroom and said, oh, I forgot something. And she'd come running back out. She had been to Italy that year, and she had this bottle, this beautiful whiskey bottle that was leather clad and had four different shot glasses on it. She said, I was going to give this to you as a gift. And I said, oh, great. So she popped it. I had two more shots, and those were the last drinks that I've had. Now, I'd like to say that all of the things after that rolled in the right direction and they were easy, but they weren't. Uh, I was happier, I think, within the first six months that I had cleaned up a little bit. 
Um, but it was, it was, it was dangerous for me to feel confident, I think, because my will had really been the thing that crushed me. My inability to surrender had been the thing that had crushed me. And so when I came into the first room, I was just, I didn't want to surrender. I was just happy to see a bunch of people who didn't want to molest me, didn't want drugs and alcohol from me. Matter of fact, you didn't seem to want anything from me at all, except to shake my hand and ask me, how am I doing? But at the second meeting that I went to, I think it was one of the most critical ones because the topic was sponsorship and people talked about it. I don't know what they talked about, but after the meeting, I, I went outside the meeting and I stood on the steps and a person that I had seen the week before was there. And I said, Janet, what's a sponsor? And she said, it's somebody that you, you hear in the rooms that you identify with and you, and you ask them to help you with the program. And I turned to this guy that was standing literally arm's length away from me to the left. And I said, will you be my sponsor? And the poor guy looked at me and he looked at Janet and he looked at me and he looked at Janet and he said, what do I do? And she said, you do it. Now, this guy had 90 days sober. He didn't know what he was doing, but he did know enough to say, okay, let's go out to Howard Johnson's. I'm going to be going to my job at Friday night. That was the meeting. I'm going to be going to my job on the railroad yard at Rensselaer Railroad at, at midnight, but I've got a couple hours. Let's go have some coffee and talk. Now I went to that meeting and I wanted to jump straight to the ninth step. I, he and I sat across from each other and I said, what's that ninth step thing? I, I, I know if I, I need to, I need to clean this up. I need to do this. And he said, let's, let's talk about step one and let's talk about step two. And let's talk about step three. And that's where I really got stuck. He was a great guy. He and I were sponsor and sponsee for about six months. But I couldn't grapple with step three. I just couldn't. The idea of turning my will and my life over to the care of anything was not going to happen. I had been dragged through so much in my life and felt pretty sorry for myself. Self-pity was really a struggle for me. But what mattered the most was that he showed up for me. So I didn't have to turn my will and my life over to him. I didn't have to turn my will and my life over to any people. All I had to do was find what that meant for myself. And I'll tell you, that was, that was kind of an awful, awful journey for me. Um, because every time I, I started to seek an understanding of who my higher power was, uh, I'd get excited about maybe this or that idea, this kind of higher power, this kind of higher power. But eventually I'd, it would just fall flat. And I would feel really almost despondent that there's no higher power that wants me. I'm not good enough. I'm not connecting. I'm not making sense of this. And I'd heard other people in the rooms, newcomers, old comers, old timers, everyone would, you know, talk about their relationship with their higher power. And I, I didn't have it. I just didn't have it. And eventually I, I, I kind of started to give up on that. But by the time I got about a year um, sober, and I will say it was more dry than it was sober, uh, I found another sponsor, and his name's Richard. Hi, Richard. He's probably listening right now. And Richard and I have been uh, sponsor sponsee. He's been my sponsor for about 34 years now, and it's made all the difference in the world. Uh, Richard, again, stopped right from the beginning of our relationship and talked to me about the first three steps. But he said, you don't have to have an understanding of a higher power that's perfect. You don't have to know exactly who your higher power is. You really just need to have the second step in place and then be willing to align your will with a power greater than yourself, even if you don't know what it is. And the confusing thing for me was, if I don't know who God is, if I don't know who my higher power is, how can I align my will with a power greater than myself? How am I going to take that next step and say, what am I supposed to do? Because my real key was, I didn't want to be a puppet on a string. I did not want to be the guy who surrendered his will and just became docile to a higher power. I had been docile to people who had hurt me. I'd been docile to being an adoptee. I'd been docile through my life. That's what I felt. And it frustrated me and it angered me. And there was a lot of hurt and, and rage there. And he said, you don't have to be a puppet on a string. All you need to do is make a decision to do the next sober thing. Make a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand him. doesn't have to be as convoluted as that long sentence sounds. I said, so what does it mean? He said, when, you, when, you make, when, you're, when you're working the third step, you're making a decision. I said, yeah, to do what? He said, 
the fourth step. And then the light bulb went off. Because the idea of doing God's will was foreign to me. The idea of following a spiritual path was foreign to me. The idea of knowing who my higher power was and turning my will and my life over was foreign to me. But doing a fourth step, I could do something like that. That was practical. And that was pen and paper. And he guided me through that. And then he guided me to the fifth step. It took probably three and a half hours to do my fifth step. I think he said it was still one of the longest ones he's ever had to sit through. But we did it. And he continued to work with me through the steps. And the whole idea that I'm trying to express here is that I didn't have to have a, an understanding of even what or who my higher power was when I was doing my second and third step. I had to recognize that it would be revealed to me over time. And it took a, a good seven years. And I know that sounds like a long time to someone someone listening here, but they weren't the worst seven years of my life. Parts of them were down. Parts of them were dark. Parts of them were shadowy and scary because not having a full understanding and a full relationship with my higher power felt a little disjointed at time. It felt a little bit like, well, what am I supposed to do? But again, the practice that I, that I learned from my sponsor and from people in the rooms and from the readings was do the next sober thing. And that usually means, what step am I going to work today? So one of the things was really important was to continue to go to meetings on a regular basis. That's non-negotiable in my life. And the other thing that was really important was to have that sponsor, but use them. I had to talk to them on a regular basis, but I had to work the steps with that sponsor. I had to be pretty disciplined about doing that. The, the real, I think, turning point for me when I stopped worrying about my own sobriety, when I stopped worrying about my own recovery path was when I started to do service. And I didn't think I'd ever be any good at it. I didn't think that anyone would ever want what I had to offer. And my sponsor was really clear with me. He said, it's a program of attraction rather than promotion. And you just show up and you share your story and you reach out to the newcomer. And if they're ready and if they need your help and if they want to ask you for that support, then that's what you do. But it's not about you, not about me trying to find or hook a newcomer. It's not about me trying to force my will, my service, my offerings on other folks. It was about you just show up and if your higher power and their higher power connect you, 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 you show up and you do that. You do the next over thing. And so when I started doing service, it started to make more sense to me because I could get out of myself. I wasn't worried about whether I had a higher power that was right for me or not. I was just worried about do the next sober thing, do the next step, bring someone else through the steps, make sure I continue to reach out to my higher power. But the, the biggest thing was that it's a conscious contact with a power greater than myself. So I struggled with that and to the point where I actually talked to my sponsor and I said, you know, I'm doing all this and my life is really good. Things had turned around. I went from a high school dropout to, you know, college degree. I went from somebody who couldn't keep a job who, to somebody who had a corner office and six figures and that kind of thing. Life just worked. I was, uh, I went from a divorced man who you know, didn't have his kids in his life to where I got my children back in my life and they loved me and I loved them. And I also remarried and had a beautiful family uh, with my new wife. But one of the things that I really didn't feel like I had was a, a, a real understanding of who God was to me. And I finally said to my sponsor, I said, I, I don't even know if I believe there is a God. I understand to work these steps. I understand to do service. I understand to show up. But the whole idea of being able to have a power greater than myself, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. And, and he said, you know, Kevin, it's okay if you don't believe that you have a power greater than yourself. And I think his exact words were actually, Kevin, you have a higher power that it's okay if you don't believe that you have a higher power. So he left, he, he let me off the hook and he, I mean, he kept me on the hook at the same time. And I spent the rest of that year, I spent the rest of that time really just going along my merry way without a power greater than myself in my life. I was living in New York City. I'd moved, you know, um, out of where I was from in Schenectady and my life was moving along. I was a leader in the church and, uh, you know, where I was, where I belonged and um, everything on the outside seemed to be really good. And, and I will be honest, eventually I prayed and I, uh, I, I began to meditate again. And eventually the only prayer that I really prayed was, um, God, I can't find you. 
please lead me to you. And so that was really the humility that needed to, to enter into my life was realizing that as much as I had to surrender to this program, I had to surrender to the fact that of myself, I was incapable of actually finding that higher power. But I trusted that if I opened myself up, that higher power would, would reveal itself to me, and it has. And that's between me and my higher power, and I don't share that too openly here. But one of the most important things is that that was a turning point for me. As I started to move forward in my program after that, things did start to fall into place. Colors in my life started to really get more, more vibrant. The relationships I had with people started to show themselves as being more, more, more spiritually based, more spiritually founded, not just about transactional, not just about what can I get, what can you give. But one of the things that also happened, and I want to be clear in my recovery, there has not always been a humility that, um, that I could, that I could really count on for myself. And, um, one of the things that happened was all these things that started to come to fruition, this ability for me to really be productive in society and this ability for me to be a father and be a husband and be a friend and be all these things, they started to take more of my time. And I think that's one of the things that I want to give uh, a little heads up on. When I when I started to get real busy in this program, I thought that was the benefit of sobriety. And then one day I realized um, I had become too busy. First, I got too busy to maybe do my morning prayer and meditation. So that started to slip away. And then maybe I got, I got too busy to, to really do service on a regular basis. And, and I didn't have time to work with people, didn't have time to maybe run a meeting, didn't have time to do a podcast like this. But then what really started to happen that changed for me was I stopped working the steps with my sponsor and eventually really stopped calling him. And the last thing that was standing, the last piece that was there in my life because the service was gone and my sponsor was, we were disconnected and, and I really wasn't praying anymore. The last thing that was there was meetings, but you know what? I got too busy for meetings and I wasn't going to meetings on a regular basis and I wasn't hooking up with people. And you know what happened? The less I went to meetings, the harder it was to feel that I could go to meetings. I started to feel that disjointed sense that I felt when I was trying to get myself sober, when I was trying to get to my first meeting, it felt foreign to me. I felt like, how can I go there? I don't even know who those people are anymore. And that didn't happen overnight. And that's really important to really emphasize. This wasn't like a day or a week or a month that took years. And over a period of four years, I think in probably about the 12th year of my recovery, I, I had that start, that process started and it was very insidious and it was very slow. And I just slowed down on the meetings and I got too busy, slowed down on working the program, slowed down on, on praying and meditating. And then when I was about 13 years, it was even less. And then when I was 14 years, I wasn't really sober anymore. I was dry. I think I went to one meeting that whole year. And that 15th year, I, I, I didn't even go to a meeting. I didn't hit a meeting once. I was still working that full-time job, had a wife, had two kids. I had a whole life around me, and I didn't want to see my wife. I'd work till two in the morning and take a car service home so I didn't have to spend time with my kids. And I felt so disconnected and disjointed and confused. And it's what we call a dry drunk. Those were the moments, I think, that were some of the hardest in my entire uh, last 34, almost 35 years, were those four years because my poor wife and the people around me, they knew that they knew who I was. They knew who I was when I was working the program and they didn't know what had happened to me because they didn't realize that all the me that they saw were just the benefits of sobriety. That wasn't their business. That wasn't their, their problem. That wasn't their responsibility. It was mine to work the program. It was mine to do these things. But I will say that at the, at the end of those four year stretch, which I call a dry drunk in which it was, uh, I hadn't had a drink, but I was suicidal. I hadn't had a drop of alcohol. I didn't even want to drink. But then one night I, I remember I'd had, I think there was a bottle of cooking wine in the house. And it was, uh, I found it. It was about three in the morning and I sat in the kitchen and I uncorked that and I held it to my, to my lips and I put it right under my nose and I said, Kevin, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. And I had one phone number that was left in my head. Uh, it was uh, a friend of mine. Her, her son had been the, um, the, the ring bearer at our wedding. And 
for some reason, I still had her number in my head. The only person in the program, I didn't even have my sponsor's number memorized, but I had her number memorized. And I called that number. And when I called her, it was three in the morning and she just picked up. I think it was second ring. And she cleared her cobwebs and said, yeah. And I said, Sally, it's me, Kevin. She said, what's going on? I said, uh, I have a bottle of cooking wine in my hand. I'm going to drink it. She woke up. She said, okay. She said, where, where are you right now? I said, I'm in my apartment. She said, I want you to go to the kitchen. I said, I'm in the kitchen. She said, I want you to go to the sink. I said, oh shit, is this really happening to me? Because these are the stories that we hear in the rooms all the time. And I just, it dawned on me. I'm like, I can't believe this is actually happening to me, that this is what's going on with me right now. I said, okay, I'm at the sink. She said, pour it down the drain. And I did. And I poured that bottle down the drain. And by the grace of God, I did not have a drink. And I will say that the, 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 that was not the turning point. That was not the turning point. About a month later, I got fired from that corner office job. And I was so distraught that I was, I was suicidal. And instead of having a bottle of cooking wine in my hand, I had a razor blade in my hand and I was trying to force myself to, to cut my wrist. And by the grace of God, again, I did not do that. And I eventually did talk to my sponsor. And he said something that was pretty magical and mystical. And I say that with a little bit of tongue in cheek because you know what I'm going to say. He said, well, you might want to think about going to a meeting tomorrow. And it was humbling, but I did it. And it was funny because I went to that first meeting. I hadn't been in over a year. And at that very first meeting, I shared. And at that very first meeting, there was another newcomer there. And he asked me to sponsor him. I swear within 90 days, I was right back where I had been before I had slacked off on meetings, before I had slacked off on the program. It didn't take that long to get back where I was, but it was a heavy climb. It was a lot of work. It was going to meetings and it was, it was talking to my sponsor on a regular basis and it was doing the steps and it was working this program and it was doing service. Couldn't believe. I didn't know why this guy had asked me to sponsor him when I was just walking back in the door like that, but he saw something. There was something that attracted him. And then eventually, of course, one of the most important pieces was to, to have that relationship with that power greater than myself and to, to work in that area of my life again. Now, that was in 2001 when I got fired from that job. And that was the summer of 2001 when I was living in New York City. And I was able to climb back out of that dry drunk and start working the program. And just when I thought things were getting better, just when I felt like things were going on the right path, um, I was getting ready to start looking for a new job and, uh, it was a September morning in 2001 and I was living in Brooklyn and 9-11 happened. And I don't know how to say this without, without being honest, but I, I, the last thing I thought about was drinking. The last thing I thought about was I'm going to go get drunk. The first thing I thought about was thank God, thank God I'm sober. Thank God I got back in these rooms when I did. That's the very first thing I thought of. And it may sound self-centered, but it wasn't because I realized that, thank God that I am on this path to recovery again, because now I can be there for my wife. I can be there for my sons. I can be there for my family. I can be there for my community. And it was the hardest time. It was a terribly hard time. But since 2001, I have not looked back at that as a terrible time uh, in, um, in my recovery. I've looked back on that as an unforgettable mile marker in my sobriety. And I hope and pray that every day that I remember that time because I learned a lot. And I just really described what I learned, which was there were five things in my life that I wasn't doing when I was out drinking, that I started doing when I came into recovery, and that I stopped doing when I was, when I was on the dry drunk. And when I put them back in my life, everything changed. I go to meetings on a regular basis. I work with my sponsor. I do the steps with my sponsor. I do service and I have a relationship with a power greater than myself. Those five things are now, they are indispensable to me and they are something that are non-negotiable for me in my life. Those are the pieces of my life that have, have really put me in a place of, to be able to be of service to God and others. Not always perfectly, not even nearly perfectly. But I can, 
I can understand that if I don't do those things, that weakens my ability to align my will with God's will. That weakens my ability to be able to say, I, I can show up for my family. I can show up and do my job. And I can show up for the alcoholic who still suffers. What's happened over to, to me over the last 10 years has been pretty tumultuous. My dad died about 10 years ago. Uh, and I, I also want to add this part of the story in because it was really important and some people um, may identify with it or at least in the future may, may understand it. Um, but I, I always thought that working the program would fix everything, and it does. It does do a lot of good things, and it sets me up, but it's a foundation for living. It's not every solution. If I have rheumatoid arthritis, which I do, I take medicine. I don't just go to meetings and you know hope that it, my rheumatoid arthritis gets better. If I have diabetes, I'm going to take medicine. If I have a heart condition, I'm going to do that. Well, when my dad passed away, I thought I was dealing with it really well, and I did. I was there by his side when he passed away, and that was a real miracle of, of sobriety. But unfortunately, it caught me by surprise over the next year, and the grief took me to places I had never been before, and I became depressed without knowing it and got to the point of being suicidal again. Um, and it was so bad that I did need to reach out for help and I did need to get some professional guidance on that. I was trying to deal with it on my own. I was doubling down on meetings. I was doing all those five things that I talked about. And yet it just got worse and worse and worse. So when I reached out for help, I got the medical help that I need. I got the medicine, some medicine that I needed. And I, you know, I was able to get the guidance that I needed and then get the therapy I needed because I had a condition that was outside of our rooms, outside of the alcoholism itself. And that was really important me, for me to remember because I, I think that I learned something there, which was, again, the whole piece of all my struggles have not been about the alcohol itself. It's about my lack of humility. It's about me being humble. And the thing that my sponsor taught me a long time ago and it's really a mantra for me and something I never forget is, if I do not become humble, I will be humiliated. I've shown that to myself all through all the years of drinking and drugging. I've shown that to myself when I went on that dry drunk. That was a total lack of humility. I thought I could do it my way. And then when I was depressed, of course, I didn't know it. So I don't, I don't really blame myself. But the real struggle I had was not that I didn't want help, but I didn't want the help that I didn't want. I wanted only to get the help that I thought I needed because I thought I should be able to deal with this on my own. I thought I should just be able to do more, more meetings, more service, more praying, more meditating, more work, work the steps, double down on meetings, whatever I needed to do. I thought, I know what to do and I'll do it my way. Every time I do it my way, I usually end up being humiliated. My strengths now don't come from me. They come through, through me from my higher power. Anything that I'm able to really give to my children comes directly from my higher power. Anything that I'm able to share, experience strength and hope in, um, in any relationship with a sponsee or in meetings uh, or doing something like this, this is just me as a vessel. Uh, I hope that the experience, strength and hope that comes through me isn't altered or, or uh, muted by my own uh, lack of humility or my own ego or my own self-will run riot. Um, and every day I do the best I can to ask, to ask God in prayer and meditation to just to make use of me. And that's been a long road, but January 1 this year will be 35 years. And I'm very grateful for the, the time, um, but I'm even more grateful for today. I'm more grateful that I was able to wake up this morning and as soon as my eyes opened, I knew exactly why I was here, to be of service to God and others. And um, I'm grateful for the time that we had today. Um, I, I don't always do these kind of podcasts uh, regarding recovery, but I think it's important and I'm really happy that we had the time together and I hope some someone who's listening got something out of this. Um, I thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for thanks for letting me let me share this. Thank you. That was a very powerful story. Do you have a website or social media or any way that people could connect with you? 
Sure, and again, I identified as Kevin, but my name is Kevin Barheit, and I will break my anonymity just for that. Uh, the last name is Barheit, B-A-R-H-Y-D-T. And I do have a YouTube channel in which I share some of these thoughts, and they aren't just on recovery. They're not just on recovery from and sobriety. Uh, in the, this program, in the 12 steps, they also focus on if someone is struggling with, uh, say, abandonment issues, adoption issues, and also issues regarding uh, child sexual abuse, which I've recovered from that too. And and I think that's been helpful for me to share my story on, on the channel, and I hope it might help others. So if you'd like to just uh, find me there and subscribe and connect with me there, that'd be great. I'm also on Twitter, and um, there's a, uh, a memoir coming out soon called Dear Stephen Michael's Mother, which is all about the journey that I just described and quite a lot more. Thanks again, Kevin. Thank you. Kevin, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story with us. If you would like to find out more about Kevin or get in contact with him, you can find him at kevinbarhide.com, as well as on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And be sure to check out his YouTube channel. All of those links will be in the show notes. Thanks again, Kevin. You've been listening to Recovery Survey. If you got anything out of today's episode, I'd ask you to please leave us a five-star review and share this episode with a friend. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can find us at recoverysurvey.com. You can listen to all of our episodes on the website as well as connect with us on social media where you can get previews for upcoming episodes. Hey guys, I wanted to let you know about an exciting new partnership with Broken Chains Apparel. They're a custom online shirt retailer that designs cool shirts for people in recovery. They want you to be proud of your recovery and wear it boldly. They're offering our listeners a 20% discount. All you have to do is use the promo code recovery at checkout. Go grab your shirts today at brokenchainsapparel.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Broken Chains Apparel.